I was talking to you. I saw you after the boat, right after you got the fire in your face last week. I can still see some bad burn tissue. Are you going to be able to defend your belt tonight? Well, like I said, uh, Jim, uh, I'm not going to condone what Muckin Singh did by blinding me. If he thinks he's going to stop me, if he thinks I'm going to throw that belt down and take it, let him come in and take it away from me, he's got another thing coming. He can try to break my ribs. He can try to blind me. He can bust my head open on ring posts. But I tell you something, Muck and Sink, you'll never take this North American belt away from me. As long as I live, when I'm in this ring, you'll never stop me, Muck and Sink. I'm not going to let a scum like you, you son of a... I'm not going to let you take this belt. I'm not going to let you throw fire in my eyes and take this belt the way you did. I'm going to walk in this ring, whether I can see or not, and I guarantee you, I'm going to knock the hell out of you, and I'm going to walk out of this ring with this belt around my waist. Look up. up top. Owen Hart just went to the top rope. Elbow. This could be it. Dynamite kicks out. Jim Davis, what a brutal match. An incredible boat and Ed Whalen, you'll notice he's not at the mic. That's because he was restraining the weasel who is handcuffed to Ed and Ed kept him out of the ring from interfering once again. A spectacular match. This street fight summer sizzler 89 action at its finest. You know, here comes Johnny Smith. Oh, he, he missed him. There goes Johnny Smith over the top rope. Here's a small package. He did it. He won it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. All right, Jesse, you're about ready to see a most unusual athlete, so we're told. So we're told who told you. I think I am? Who the hell do you think you are? You won't think I owe you a an apology? Oh. I don't owe you a thing. I'm sick and tired of trying to please everybody else around here. And the stops right here. Wow. Well, I'm showing McMahon plenty of respect. This could get very, very ugly in a hurry. Now, my brother, Brett, and Neidhart, and Bulldog, they did what they had to do. And now it's time for me to do what I have to do. And that is remain right here. Here at, uh, in Kansas City, uh, tragedy befell the World Wrestling Federation and all of us. Owen Hart was uh, set to make an entrance from the ceiling, and uh, he fell from the ceiling. And I have the unfortunate responsibility to let everyone know that Owen Hart has died. Owen Hart has tragically died from that accident here tonight. Welcome to Agree or Disagree, the podcast. My name is Kevin Olenek. Uh, you can follow me, of course, on Twitter at K-E-V-O-L-E. -E. You can find that subscribe to all podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Find me as a friend on Facebook, Kevin Olenek. Uh, you can also go to Spreaker.com, K-E-V-O-L-E, -E, to find all podcasts as well. And I know that that's a bit of a cold, chilling opening, but... Uh, our topic today is a little cold and chilling and, and retrospective. But first, I'd like to take you back to 
the 80s and the 90s and Friday nights in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Many of us would head down to the stand, the pavilion in downtown Calgary, where we would head to watch some of our favorite wrestling stars. Some of the greatest heels, before, by the way, they were called heels, stars like Bad News Allen, Archie the Stomper Goldie, Dynamite Kid, Great Gamma, Muck and Sing, would do battle against the stars like Jim Neinhardt, Faces, before they were called Faces, Jim Neinhardt, Davy Boy Smith, Brian Pillman, and, of course, the Hart family, which included Keith, Bruce, Brett, and a young, dynamic flyer named Owen. The play-by-play voice, for the most part, was the late, great Ed Whalen, who every Saturday would use terms like a ring-a-ding-dong-dandy. And in the meantime, and in between time, those talents that we just talked about would eventually lead to the mainstream spotlight known then as the WWF. It would grace our Saturday afternoons, and then eventually, of course, our Monday nights. And there was a sense of pride from Calgary watching these stars that came. A smile, sort of an excitement. And part of that smile left on May 23rd, 1999. That was when Owen Hart, playing the role of the Blue Blazer, which was a parody to the WCW rival Sting, would go, would be going down the Kemper region in Kansas City on a harness. That harness disconnected, and he fell to his death. It's been 20 years or so since that day, and today we look back on the life of Owen Hart, the tragedy of that event, and in a sense, really, how that event has actually impacted now. And joining me today to do this is Alicia Hope Ross. You can find her at Poor Choices on Twitter. She's a professional social media strategist, professional broadcaster, professional fundraiser, and a professional wrestling enthusiast. And you can also probably see her in a helicopter checking out the Calgary traffic. How are you today? I'm uh, I'm doing fine. It's been a it's been a long day. Been up since four this morning, but. Uh... Other than that, it's been a it's been a good day. How about yourself? Not that I have not been up since four, but I was I was up early. Yeah, uh, so, not four. <laughs> um, no, don't do that to yourself. No, not unless not unless you actually do have the morning job in radio. And yeah, make sure you at least go to bed at three. That's all I'm saying. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Life advice. Um, I think that the way that I wanted to kind of start this is, is I think there's a lot of people out there that will be listening to this podcast that doesn't know, won't remember Stampede Wrestling. And probably, maybe this is the way that I sort of remember it, and you can kind of tell me what you remember. But I kind of, it kind of would be, it is the NXT, I, I guess it would be the closest thing to parallel it was with what current, the current product is known as NXT. It was really a great place to for some of these stars to develop. There were some great matches. Um, it had sort of there was there was blood at times, but there was a lot of really great storytelling, and it was just a really great developing ground for for superstars and and the independent territory for people to to begin. What what did you remember about Stampede Wrestling? Yeah, absolutely. It, it hit it on uh, hit it on the head there um, with regards to kind of their impact. Like you said, close to NXT, but you know, Stampede Wrestling was was started even before there was an idea of of going up from Stampede Wrestling. That was still the end all be all for a lot of these guys. Um, for myself, I was I was honestly far 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 too young um, <laughs> to enjoy uh, Stampede Wrestling in its real heyday. I got to watch it uh, in the early '90s when it was on. Uh, after WWF Superstars on Saturday mornings, um, which was my like best time of the whole week, uh, and I think by then most of the the major hearts had, of course, moved off to WWF. Um, so I kind of caught them here and there, but it was uh, kind of getting my feet wet in that sort of area. But you know, just to see how they they really built Calgary from the ground up. Um, they, you know, along with the Flames, they, they, the Flames and the Olympics and, and the Hart family and Stampede Wrestling really put Calgary on the map. 
So that's kind of kind of what uh, got me into them. And, you know, I, I grew up with three older brothers and, uh, you know, I was kind of around wrestling since the day I was born, just in terms of it always being on TV. So, you know, Stampede Wrestling uh, growing up in Calgary is just, you know, it's what you do with that. You know, if you're around Calgary in the 80s and 90s, it was just part of your blood. Yeah. Yeah. And it was I mean, and there were a lot of, like, the Honky Tonk Man came through there. Dr. Yeah. David Schultz came through there. Uh, I mentioned Pillman. Uh, there was uh, the late lethal Larry Cameron. Did you see Larry Cameron? He would have been around early 90s, I think. No, I, I can picture him in my head, but I never saw him. Yeah. Um, I do know before, uh, before the... Uh, even I think uh, Brett, well, I think it would have been when Brett was around. My dad was a lawyer for Archie the Stomper Goldie. Um, oh, wow. And he, he represented Archie in his divorce case. <laughs> so back oh. in the early 80s. And uh, just a just a, a side story was one day my dad got a phone call um, from the opposing counsel. He said, uh, do you know your client bites people? <laughs> And it's just that's what the what the other uh, the other attorney was going to go after was you know this is a professional wrestler and you know he's a very vile man. It's like oh, that's not <laughs> you don't understand. But that's you know that's how wrestling was then. Like nobody really realized a lot of these times that these men were just characters. Yes. So that that was really part of it. And you you'd mentioned earlier too Ed Whalen. Um, I imagine he w- was a, a huge influence on both of our careers in terms of broadcasting. Oh yeah, he, uh, like he, his stampede wrestling stuff was just so entertaining because he would just get so, he would get so into it and it was so fascinating when he was doing the flames games because he would be so straight laced when he actually would call the Calgary flames game, you would hear Uh sort of like a professional flames play by play broadcaster. But when he was in getting into stampede wrestling and he would get into it with J.R. Foley, uh, when he would get into it with, with bad news, he would just, he would really get into it. It was so fun to watch. Oh, it's absolutely incredible. And he would get in the middle of it. You know, Oh, he was fantastic. And it was just another, like you said, just kind of that, that weaving through the dynamic of it being such a part of, of the whole show. And if, even if you go down to the pavilion now, um, and down to the corral, it still kind of has that haunted feeling to it, that something important's happened there. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I, I don't imagine wrestling fan, uh, non wrestling fans would ever pick up on that, but it, it's magical. Yeah. Uh, as far as specifically Owen, mm-hmm. um, I remember his matches with dynamite kid, he had some great matches with Gamma Singh. It's amazing Gamma Singh is still in the wrestling industry. Yeah. He's still, Absolutely, yeah. Like, it's, and a, before he was uh, the Bastion Booger Muckins, him and M- Muckins Singh had some just incredible matches. Just And that whole storytelling between the size and Owen Hart's ability just to move around the ring was just... It was something to, to see. And it was, that was probably... Uh, at least top three of probably one of some of my favorite feuds that, that happened uh, in Stampede Wrestling myself that I remember. Oh, absolutely. Just going back and watching those matches, he was on just a, a completely different level from from all the other guys that were around at that time. I mean, you had Dynamite, um, and then with Owen, it brought a bit more of the Japanese styling in and kind of that almost luchador style as they'd have it now. Because um, there wasn't much high flying. I mean, Calgary kind of evolved from these bruisers to kind of mat grappling, and then with Dynamite and Owen and that type of group, it became a lot more aerial. And like you said, you know, there was some blood involved, getting into the stands. Like they would really go at it. Yeah, it made it feel so real. Like, mm-hmm. uh, and oh, and one of the underrated things that Owen, I don't think, got enough credit for was his promo work. Uh, he, he could cut, I would actually say like, I know that there's been debate about who was the better wrestler. I definitely mm-hmm. think Owen was the best promo. Like, he Oh, just, hands down, hands it, down. It was unbelievable to, to just listen to, he, he would just carry it. He had such an incredible sense of humor, which I think we'll get into the WWE days. They were the ones that kind of captured that more than anything else. But, um, he had just... He just knew he could carry the mic, like, was 
Like I think it was, that is so undervalued about his what his talent was. Yeah, like just the complete package of it, and he, he could go anywhere from being the you know the goody two shoes you know Calgary boy here to to also being that you know snively just gross little brother that you you want to get beat up. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of really really went over you know the whole the whole board. Yeah, yeah, uh, and so then really. Uh, it was then I remember watching with my best best friend and it was Saturday nights. We were or Saturday afternoons, the superstar show. And there was this mask guy that came on that uh, was called the blue blazer that made his debut. And I, I thought he looked familiar. Mm. And then my friend was like, that's Owen Hart. I'm like, that's not Owen Hart. How can you tell that that's Owen Hart? He's like, that's Owen. He was just jumping all over the place. It's like, we got to make sure we record this. Owen Hart's on WWF at the time. It's just, he was so, it was such an exciting sort of um, moment when Owen, I, I, I think like it was good to see Brett. It was the British Bulldog at the time. The Hart Foundation and the British Bulldogs were having their little the, that tag, their tag team series there. But it was just uh-huh. something I think about Owen that got into the WWF that felt, for me anyway, there was some sort of sense of excitement about that. It's just because he was kind of my favorite at the time. Yeah, and I didn't even know about the Blue Blazer necessarily until until much later, like reading it in the old. Uh the pro wrestling illustrated magazines myself. Um, I got into him when he was with Coco beware. <laughs> oh yes, that's right. <laughs> Which was a bit after the, uh, the blazer. Um, and it was like just such a thrown together little gimmick, but they had the funny pants. I think, what were they high energy or something? Yes, they were. They were high energy. Yeah. Yes. And that's kind of when I got into him there and I knew he was a, a Calgary boy. Um, and I, I, I don't think I went outside of Canada probably would have even known who, who the hell this guy was. But he was so fun to watch. Like, my goodness. And he was doing stuff that they just weren't doing then. No, he was, yeah, he was very high risk before it became. And he, I'm going to, I'm going to age, I'm going to be like, you know, these young ones these days <laughs> do this. But the high risk back then was like, it was, wasn't the spot fest. It was like. We're legitimately doing stuff that is like not to get the crowd, not necessarily, I mean, it gets, it's going to get the crowd into it, but it actually felt like a flow of the match where at times the high risk stuff is to get the crowd. Nowadays seems to be getting the crowd more into the match. There was, does that make sense? Oh yeah, completely. Yeah. It, it, and it's almost, um, try, trying to figure out the word in for it. it. It was more the impact of the move then. Uh, where now it seems it was more, it's more just getting the crowd involved. It's the getting the, you know, this is awesome. Like yes. that sort of chant where I, I, it's, I, and I guess I, we're both we just in that sort of, um, that group of just when we, we came up, like I'm excited for the, you know, uh, all elite wrestling coming into, into the view, but it's still one of those things of high flying now just is almost Cirque du Soleil like yes um, when then it then it was more like okay if somebody's ho- jumping off the ropes on top of you it's because he's using his full weight on your body that's the reason he's doing it um, as opposed to just like oh he's got you know five flips in there and yeah. <laughs> it, it just it was so different it was like you said it just new and and, and unparalleled at that time. I mean, even if you look at Dynamite Kid, you know, the most high flying he really did was the flying headbutt. Yes, that's true. And a lot of people looked at him as more of a high flyer, but he didn't, he wasn't that high flying type. He was more ground based. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he, like he, I, he, he's like the man that we do not name anymore had his style very similar to Dynamite Kid. Uh, yep. In that same way, I and mean, it's sort of, but it was more ground based, more ground based storytelling. At, at yeah, the, time. the high impact, just the full, full push, uh, you know, constant energy sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, like, really yeah. gritty, almost uh, not MMA style, but just that same sort of of viciousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Owen was basically mostly during that time too. He was in tag teams because eventually he. Tag, he finally tagged with JV Boyd for a little bit. He had the team with Jim Neinhardt. Uh, mm-hmm. Then, um, 
but he really got on the map with his series of matches with with Brett. Uh, what did you remember? What did you like about those matches? What did you think of those? Um, oh man, that was that was the height. <laughs> I'm you know everybody's always about the Attitude Era or the Hogan Era, um, and for me it was undoubtedly like 1993, 1995. Um, Brett and Owen, and I was a massive Bret Hart fan. Like, I had Bret Hart posters on my walls. I was just, oh, like, massively obsessed with the guy. Um, but at that point, I, I became such a big Owen Hart fan, and I don't know if it was because I was also the, the youngest sibling in my family and, you know, had that same sort of mentality of being in the shadow all the time um, or, or just what it was. But like you said, with his, his mic work, he always stood out. Uh, and my, my favorite match to this day is their SummerSlam 1994 match in the cage. Uh, it was uh, it, it's still on another level, and I wouldn't have seen it live. I probably rented the rented the tape at Blockbuster. Uh, but I I was I must have worn it out watching that match just over and over. I still prefer it uh, to the WrestleMania match, but that's really what put him on the map. Yeah, that match for sure. And I, yeah, the win, the WrestleMania win, I think. It put him over, but you're right. I think that the sun that mat that SummerSlam match was what I think people started to see the talent that all of us in Calgary were noticing of Owen Hart because really he was more of the comedic character, which he did really well. Um, but that was when we were like, "There's this is Owen Hart. This is what we've all known. We're about to to see." And it's sort of it's funny now because. Uh, and we'll we'll talk about this a little bit later, but certainly I think we when we see the NXT star in WWE, we're like, why is it taking so long for people to for, for Vince to figure this out? <laughs> well, look back at Owen Hart, folks. It's the same damn thing. <laughs> oh yeah, like you know, the cream rises to the top, but at the same time, it's going to take quite a while to get there. It seems. Yeah, yeah, and then. It, yeah, from there, there was um, lots of other other stuff happened. He got back into tag teams. Um, mm-hmm. He did get he did get the opportunity uh, after the Montreal screw job. He was uh, and sort of around that time, sort of it was when he had the match with with Stone Cold Steve Austin. When you know it was an honest botch, but. Uh, he he broke Austin's neck, um, but you know what was you know, give him credit in terms of keeping that character together. That was the other. That's the that, that was his spectacularness of sort of uh, keeping sort of the character of one heart together and allowing Stone Cold really to become Stone. Like he was flying, but I mean, I think Owen Hart. I think. Uh, certainly, I know Stone Cold gives him some a little bit of credit for that, uh, keeping that going. Um, and then he had the the match at Survivor Series with with Stone Cold, and he was sort of scheduled to get be on the rise. He was he was sort of next in line to face Shawn Michaels after the Montreal Screw Job. It just didn't mm-hmm. didn't happen. Uh, why do you think that didn't happen? Oh, I, I think I think just Stone Cold was too hot at the time. Like you just couldn't touch it. Yeah. Um, and and uh, yeah, he had the 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 small time as the Black Heart because um, everybody else had left and he was stuck in his contract. And I thought that was you know one of the best best things I had ever seen was you know he came out of the crowd at one point and just kicked the snot out of Austin and and it, it was different and it was cool and he had a bit more of an edge um, and it, and that just kind of tapered off and I I still don't know what the case was there, if it was a bit of uh, backstage, you know, just being, you know, I know Austin had always been kind of mad about a break in his neck, uh, completely uh, shoot on that one. And then, you know, maybe it was a bit of Vince, you know, wanting to stick it to a heart again. Um, but he just never seemed to get, get that opportunity again. And then he was kind of shuffled around and then put in a tag team with Jeff Jarrett and Deborah, And it just kind of all got, you know, it was a lot of wasted potential. Yeah. Yeah, and then, yeah, it's it certainly was, and and, and Ward knows that Vince has never been a, a vindictive before, Alicia. Like, like, oh no, no, like he does not have a vindictive bone in his body at all. Probably the nicest man in the world. Probably, probably <laughs> for sure. Yeah, um, yeah, and then that led. 
uh, to uh, Kemper Arena to ni- to 1999. Uh, I remember going ho- coming home from something because it was the, it was at the time it was like legitimate pay per view, and I wasn't mm-hmm. always going to spend the thirty four dollars to watch uh, watch the matches every month. I mean, it just was was too much at the time. Um, oh, it was but, ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. So there was every month and, and they weren't, you know, amazing pay-per-views of that. No, no parallels to, to now again, I guess, but, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, but you're only paying a monthly subscription. So I guess that may be different, but I, 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 I was stunned. To get, I came home and I remember like the news was like, why is wrestling on the news? Mm-hmm. And then that's when I learned that Owen Hart, died and I like just I remember just feeling just so shocked with that like just so like I literally felt like I lost a friend of mine even though he never met me (laughs) I literally felt like I lost a friend oh completely and for me I was I was young at the time so uh, it was you know my my grandpa passed away when I was three and it didn't really impact me but he was you know Owen Hart was one of my heroes um, and I'd always dreamed of being a wrestler. And, you know, I remember when I got the news, we'd been out, uh, my family had a cottage at Regina beach and we had maybe, I think like three TV channels, like just the local news. Otherwise I, I watched wrestling tapes all the time. That's all I did. When I read all the different magazines, I think I had every single wrestling magazine that they'd released then. Um, and uh, and I was obsessed with the idea of, you know, I'm going to become a wrestler. I'm going to get trained by the hearts. I'm going to know Owen. I'm going to, you know, he's, he's going to be, uh, you know, I'm going to be a protege. That was kind of my thing. Um, and we were out at the cottage that, uh, that Sunday night and um, had the news on and it came up that he died and my heart just sunk. Yeah, it was, it was just so like, it was, it was just a shock. And you know, learning now, kind of a little bit more of the story. Oh, are you still there? Record. There we are. Edit, okay. edit that bit out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm probably not. We just had a little bit of a Skype technical issue. It happens. <laughs> it um, does happen. It happens to the best of them. Yes. Uh where were we? Um, yeah, so we were talking. Oh, the night, yeah. Yeah, that night. I And kind of looking back, like, then kind of looking back because I didn't see it that night. I, I would have thought uh, that that would have ended the show, like everyone would have left. And, you know, you look, kind of read the news the next day. And lo and behold, they continued the show. Yeah. <laughs> And I remember at the time, at the like, at the time, a lot of media critics were like, "Why the hell are you continuing the show?" But what's even worse, uh, not only that is is sort of, um, and I would recommend, by the way, I don't know if you had a chance to, to see this or hear this, Alicia, but John Pollock from Post Wrestling did a really great audio documentary of Owen Hart's last day. Yeah, I did listen to that just, uh, what was that, two days ago when he, he released it. I listened all the way through. It was fantastic. It's absolutely, yeah, highly recommended. Um, but, like, I, the fact that they just told Jim Ross in an instant, oh, okay, like, yeah, this is what happened. And the fact that they didn't bother to actually tell the live crowd what had happened, I just can't, like... How? It's just weird. That it's is just bizarre. such weird business to me. And you would think a guy that has been running this for, at this point, pretty close to 30 years mm-hmm. would have figured this out. And how it, how he missed that, I I have no idea. No. And, he, and you, you try to set a parallel, too, of, you know, if it happened today, what would happen? Uh, Pollock made the good point of, you know, what would what would you think if it was Owen or or, or if it was Shane? Yes, like if, Jeff it, if it was Shane that, 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 yeah. that died and he was your son, would you have stopped the show? And he always wanted to ask him that. Um, or I guess it was Michael Landsberg said he wanted to ask him that. That was Jeff Merrick. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, um, 
and and the question is too, like you think about other live entertainment, you know, these days, you know, we have everything that's on live. Um, or if you had, you know, like I said, a Cirque du Soleil, or if you go to this, any sort of circus, or, you know, if you go to, to a Calgary Stampede event, you know, God forbid something happens to a performer, I would, I can't fathom the idea of sitting there and watching the rest of the show, getting home and turning on the news and finding out that the person you just watched in the ring died. Yeah. Like, it, I and I don't see many interviews of folks that were at Kemper Arena that night, which I find interesting because I'd love to get one of their perspectives. Because um, I, I, I just and and to go out and wrestle after that and have I know I remember it was I think it was Austin said or maybe it was Mick Foley said there was a soft spot on the ring where he'd fallen, um, and they were just told to avoid that corner. Like how can you? how can you go out and perform? And, and even the tribute show, they had yeah. matches and the whole thing of, well, that's what Owen would have wanted. I don't, I don't know. I just, I think that's a, a hard call to make. Yeah. Yeah. And try to kind of keep, I mean, I guess in some senses it's the mental health thing. You want to keep things sort of therapeutic, I mm-hmm. guess. But at the same time, it just felt like, it just felt so weird and, and outside and, you know, they eventually continued to do, they did that with the Eddie Guerrero tribute. Uh, mm-hmm. They did two um, with Raw and SmackDown and maybe like that's a way to do it. And there's ways to make pay tribute to, to the wrestler that way. But I mean, we've, we, there's been even recent, uh, stories, um, Pero Wild, they stop the match. Like outside of WWE, they have the good sense of stopping things. Uh, but inside WWE, I, I, they, they don't. Uh, even if you look at Jerry, what happened with Jerry Lawler, now, now that I think mm-hmm. about that, they still kept going. <laughs> like they're, I mean, people are sitting in the, uh, in Montreal watching what happens and they're expecting Michael Cole to continue his sort of carry the show and it's like just what's what's it's okay to stop like, i just wonder i guess because they don't know what the alternative is though because you know do you have to pay because i think his concern just always and i don't want to make any assumptions about vince mcmahon and their business but it, it a lot of it is just so dollar first like, was there concern? Was, was it going to be, we have to pay these ticket buyers back? We're going to have to pay back the pay-per-view money? I, what What was, the, like, the reasoning? Like, it just always seems so financial-based. Like, with the Jerry Lawler thing. Well, what do we do if we, if like, Raw can't go off the air? Like, that, that was just their whole thing. And, and you see it continuing through their business transactions now. Like, the, the controversy over Saudi Arabia and the fact that they keep going back there and they've got, you know, however, however many you're multi-million dollar contract with them um meanwhile everyone's saying you know you know boycotting them and and saying they they don't want to go over there i mean kevin owens won't go to the saudi arabia show um and and diane o'brien said he's not going to be part of it and and they they don't want to pull out because of the financial part of it and it just it's such a strange thing of that the business side of things and the human side of things clashing and it's so it's so visible with WWE and in the Owen Hart part is just such a, a glaring uh, glance at that, I think too. Yeah. And yeah. And you make such a good point about that because it's really even how they treated Owen going forward, uh, mm-hmm. it, you know, they've never really, I mean, there's a bunch of, there's, of course, it's hard not to get into the controversy about what what his wife decided to do. And, you know, that's her decision. And I, I completely respect that. And that's absolutely her, her right in, um, in being angry. And I, I know, like, yes, it's tore a lot of family apart. And, but from the WWE's ease perspective, like, you know, you look back at that TSN interview that, that Pollock mentioned, and I, I, I like to understand that TSN is going to re-air that, was supposed to re-air that interview with Michael Landsberg. But, How interesting. Um, having the family there and sort of like just this PR move, it just felt so icky. Like it oh, felt- I remember too, is that, and I read it in um, 
Martha Hart's book, um, which is a really good read if anyone uh, gets a chance to read it. Uh, but she was she was absolutely taken aback because WWF at the time they uh, for Owen's funeral the the flower arrangement that they sent was a great big flower arrangement in the shape of the WWF logo, and that's what they thought would be appropriate for his funeral. Wow, and that's just. Oh, like it just sends a weird chill, and and I've supported that company, like I said, since I since I can remember. Like my one of my first memories was watching Hulk Hogan on TV. Yeah, um, and you know I still watch it to this day. I I've been distancing myself more and more. Um, and you know if I if there if I didn't have friends that were part of the organization, I'd probably be less likely to watch it. But it's um, you know thing like that like. In what world is that appropriate? Is continuing the show appropriate? Is this tribute show appropriate? You know, even Stone Cold going out there and cheersing Owen with a beer. You know, it, it just seemed so tone deaf at times. Um, and like you said, you know, it would be amazing if he was in the Hall of Fame, but it's just it's never going to happen due to his wife's wishes. Yeah, and it's and that's that's unfortunate. But they've never like they they haven't touched it. They haven't. No, the like they've they've given the tribute to Eddie Guerrero, and I it's completely fine. I think there's I, I I'm not saying that they shouldn't do that, but like Owen, they have stepped themselves so far away. I, it's um, and I'm mean, in part maybe that's wishes, and in part you know uh, there's so many other things, but they've never truly. I think it's what the sad part about it is they've never honored Owen. The way that I feel Owen should have been honored for who he was. Yeah, exactly. That's such a good way to say it. Uh, and the tribute show was wonderful. Like they did a they did a great job. I remember just watching it and and bawling my eyes out when they when it initially aired. Um, and it's just yeah. I, and I don't know if they'll ever have a chance to go back now and and make up for. And maybe I might even make up for, it, but just kind of like you said, show that proper tribute. And there was the DVD that came out a few years ago. Um, and I haven't been able to bring myself to watch it. I own it. I haven't watched it. Um, but it's just a, yeah, it's what, what can they do? I guess at this point too, um, to, to fix that or if, you know, if they just want to leave it in the past. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I, I, what, you know, what's interesting this week is they are in Kansas city. Oh the, really? Uh, I didn't know. The, yeah. Yeah. That's it. It is interesting. They are there. Uh, so I don't know if they're going to do anything or not, but that that's that is interesting. That's um, really interesting. Yeah, that's that's strange timing. Yeah, uh, yeah, and we went through the controversy there. Uh, we, went, but, but you know, even when we look back, because the the Monday Night Wars were sort of have been li- considered the pinnacle of what pro wrestling was. We had the WCW, we had Nitro, you had Sting doing the same thing. So mm-hmm. and Sting do, going down the rafters. So Owen is blue blazers doing the mocking sort of the same thing. Um, even that though, even that day, like the fact that they only practiced that once is mind boggling that you would put someone in that position once. Like, I, I, that's shocking in and of itself. Anyway, but like sort of the, but you know, even the Monday Nitro part, like there, may, there was Goldberg versus, then they would have Gilberg. Everyone would be doing something. There was, there was so much and everyone had that sort of that pinnacle of what it was. I sort of feel looking back, many people feel like, like wrestling sort of died around 2001 when the, the fake invasion happened. I, I yeah, think, I agree with that one. I I do too, but I also think I wonder if the match was lit here in a lot of ways it, because it just like it just felt like it took so much out of people. Like it just was seemed like such a like it literally was a death in a sense. Um, because I I don't recall the from. Night from that point to 2001, I can't really sit in here and re- remember. There was some, there was some good stuff, but it wasn't like it wasn't the same. Maybe to me, what what do you think? I, I don't know. I think that's hard to say because they really did hit their peak. I would say in 2000. Um, 
I, it was it was also Austin and The Rock was really the main focus. Um, but you're right, like it was. That's an interesting point to make that I've never really thought of because it was kind of around when you know the Monday Night Wars were right in its full swing. Um, that's a good. I, I kind of make it akin to like you said the the man who we do not speak his name. Um, I stopped watching wrestling for years after that. Mm. Um, and it took me years to get back in. And then there might have been people with the same thing with the with the Owen Hart tragedy, you know, because it was uh, it it kind of it was the thing that made them real to us. Yeah. It kind of took away that character, you know, because you have the you have the Undertakers and the Canes and you know these bigger than life superstars, and they're they're mammoth men, like they're huge. Um, and it it kind of made them human. And and that was the night, you know, Owen Hart became human to a lot of people and wrestling became real, especially the night after when you had all of them out standing on the ramp as a tribute. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. like that, it was, it, it's probably pretty, it must've been very hard for people to see that, you know, it, it was really the, the biggest breaking of uh, kayfabe at the time too was, you know, every single member of the roster out there on the stage, the only two that didn't go out were. Stone Cold, who went at the end of the show, and Undertaker, because he thought it would be un- inappropriate. Um, and, 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 and that had never been done before. And it's been done many times since. Yeah. And it's kind of, you, you, now you know that it's fake. Like, that was that was the night where I was like, oh, these are real people. And you see the widows grieving, and you see the kids, and you're like, oh, okay. And it was similar with the uh, with the Benoit thing. It was like, okay, no, these are these are real people, and they have real lives, and... Um, are, are, is our entertainment taking away from their livelihoods, you know, because you, you read about how Owen wants to retire in two years, you know, and, and they just built that new house yeah. and you wonder how different things would have been for him had that, you know, stupid, stupid accident not happened. Like, that's the thing. Like it was something that literally he should have never been doing. No one should be doing that sort of stupid stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he didn't want to. That was the thing. He's like, I don't want to do this. I like, yeah. you know, um, it, and in the, in the Martha book, I guess he turned down so many different things from them. Cause I, they'd want to have a, a fake affair with him and Deborah. And he said, no. And there were a few other things. It was just, you know, it was such a gross time for wrestling. I, I know when I watched it, I had to tell my parents, I wasn't watching it. Cause it was, you know, between Sable and, you know, it was gratuitous violence and blood and middle fingers and swears and boobs. And it was like Jerry Springer to the max. Yeah, yeah. And they were trying to get him involved in that. And it just wasn't his sort of thing. And he'd said no so many times that this is his one time saying, yes, okay, I'll do it. Yeah. Um, and the really interesting thing, too, and I don't know if it was on the, the Pollock one or if I'd, if I'd read it before, was one of the midgets was supposed to be strapped to his chest that night in uh, – Kemper Arena as well. Pollock mentioned that, yeah. Yeah, like, and what, like, that's just why, you know, and you think, you know, he already had too much weight for the the snap as is. It, it, what a horrible, stupid tragedy. Like, you can see why Martha Hart just so upset. I don't know how anyone would ever get over that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it, that's, that's true, and, and, I, I guess we have to get and I and again I sort of understand why she got angry with everyone else in the family because um of every, because you know and I understand the family's perspective because there was opportunities there Brett still had opportunities Bruce had opportunities I get it and it's it was such a sad tragic thing um and like it, yeah right it doesn't like it just and it was like and even like now that you, I think about this a little bit more, it, it, because like they were so close to being done, and they went on such a shock value sh- sort of way to get back into the number ones. Because I mean, they were lo- they lost all the stars. Um, the NWO was was and Sting was that was working in WCW for the most part. Oh and, yeah, Goldberg was coming in around the same time. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, they went the shock value and it worked, I get, it worked, um, I get, it kind of kept everybody's attention and, um, you know, I, I, I think it just says a little bit more about 
Vince McMahon and sort of who he is as a person. Sorry, I'm sorry to say that, but you know, yeah. it kind of says says a lot more. Like it, like it really feels like it's about the dollar in a lot of ways. Um, and if it was certainly about the dollar back then, and it was about ratings and you know. And yet, like you said, you, you see the you see that same thing just keep weaving through everything of you know what at what's the cost for these people's lives and it's just it's such a shame yeah. and like you said maybe that is when people tuned out you know because you realize you know they're real people and you and you know watching movies and stuff uh, it's hard to say well that chris pratt died or something like that you know if you're watching a show like that or or any of those other modern you know more more recent deaths but you know if, you, if you're watching a uh, what's uh, Joaquin Phoenix's brother, um, River Phoenix? River Phoenix, yeah. When he passed away young, you're not watching his movies, going, "Oh, geez, you know that was a a stupid thing that happened," because it was just you know, or even even the Crow, uh, Brandon Lee, uh, that passed away in like while filming a movie. Yeah. It was completely different because you don't see them as the you know wrestling so funny because they're characters, but they're real people. Um, it, it's just a hard thing to separate, I suppose. Yeah, but but yeah, go ahead. Oh, I I think the other thing that is becoming also aware, um, painfully obvious, and I I think we're we are certainly in a down period. We've been in a down period in the wrestling industry for some time, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and there's been a lot of theories as to why. But I feel honestly, starting to wonder if it's. Because the WWE has just continued to be so tone deaf continuously. Like, it's like if this was a one off with Owen Hart, I think that people would be like, okay, oh, well, it's good to see that they've learned a little bit from this incident. They haven't learned from this incident. They had, of course, they continued, they probably shouldn't have continued with after the end, even though it wasn't at the ring. Um, and people, the other thing that people forget, we don't talk about this, and this isn't been t- talked about that much, but when Brian Pillman died, he died a couple hours before the show, and they still had the show, like as oh, if yeah. nothing happened. Oh, well, uh, they had the show in the night after, they had his widow on TV. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> and that was, uh, I guess, a year before Owen had passed. Yeah. Uh, so I just, it's so bizarre. Like you said, like, when do they learn? The well, Eddie Guerrero death didn't learn. The, I mean, the Benoit one didn't nope, learn. No, they didn't learn. Uh, and, I mean, you, you talked a little bit about Saudi Arabia. I mean, they now are, I, I instead of, I mean, they've, they've at least heard the public in terms of like, oh, I can't believe you're going to Saudi Arabia. But you know what we'll do, Alicia, is we won't mention Saudi Arabia. We won't mention that we're going there. <laughs> It's weird that there's all these Saudi Arabia type of folk in the crowd, but we won't mention <laughs> where exactly we are. No, we'll just call it the Super Show. Yeah. Um, or even the recent um, Ashley Massaro yeah. uh, controversy that came out, um, that she she was uh, possibly sexually assaulted on a tour in Kuwait uh, years ago, and that possibly led to her suicide just this past week. Yeah. Um, and that's been brushed under the table. You know. How many things just keep like it, it's almost like you're waiting for that Me Too moment for WWE at this point. And as a fan, you don't want to see it happen, but at the same time, you you appreciate these people so much, and, and you grow up watching them. You, you see them, you know, it, and whether it's it's these modern wrestlers now, or if it's you know, like we said, the Gamma Sings and the Bret Hart's, the Davy Boys, you want to see it be better. <laughs> Because you don't want, you know, you look at the Hart Foundation, it was a, a five member stable, and there's one man that's still alive. Mm, yeah. Like, what? How is that even possible? Like, could you even imagine? Like, you think of a top hockey team losing an entire line, ex- save for one person. Hey, that's just, it, it's just not, it's just not a thing. <laughs> and like, well, we lost everyone from. The, the you know the Edmonton Oilers in the eighties, but Wayne Gretzky's still alive. But everyone he played with has passed. Yeah, it just would be That's what it's like for Bret Hart. Yeah. But nobody looks at it that way just because they're wrestlers. It's a very strange organization. And for me, like 
I um I was full bore. Like I worked for Stampede Wrestling briefly, um, 2009, 2010, um, when it came back underneath Bruce Hart, um, and I was full full into it. Um, like I said, I was that was my whole career goals was to be involved in wrestling. I trained a bit in wrestling, um, and then it was just getting to know a lot of the people. And, and, and the hearts were all wonderful, and everyone related to the hearts are fantastic. Uh, but there are a lot of seedy people in, in the industry that I just didn't want to have anything to do with, and that's what pushed me out ultimately. Mm. Um, and and then you and you wonder how many other go through that. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's very strange, and and it, it's a shame. Do you see a day where, and I think that one of the things that has been blocked has been that this idea of a union has been blocked for the most part, specifically WWE, but do you see a day where there will be a union in wrestling? Or I don't know. I think they're getting closer to it. I'm excited. I know uh, this, this uh, I don't know when, when your uh, podcast posts, but I, this coming weekend is the, the All Elite Wrestling show. Uh, they're They're second big pay-per-view, I guess, technically the first. Um, and that's just a, a group of young guys really, uh, with a billionaire backer with, the yes. with the NFL connections. And, and maybe that'll be the turning point with a little bit of competition to get to light a fire. Um, but I just, I just don't know. There's just so much money, um, under Vince McMahon right now. Like that's, it's just not going to change. And I don't know what can cause the change unless there's another, you know, Ted Turner, like sort of substitute, like when WCW came in. Um, but it's, I, I, I would love to see a union or at least medical care for these people. Um, it's, you know, I don't understand how, how they function. It's, I can't imagine being in an industry. I mean, I have, I have neck problems from, from training for three months. Um, when I was, when I was in my late teens, imagine doing that for 30 years. Yeah. And you don't have medical coverage. And if you're living in the States, my goodness, the, the amount of money you're spending. Yeah. That's just crazy. And they all got addictions and they all die young. And it's just a, it's a bizarre industry. And I don't understand why nothing's been done to change that. And it comes down to, I think, what we've and, – and I, I – you know – I think what this is what Owen Hart probably recognized that's he like he wanted to get out and just live his life in a peaceful way but we've we've admired this sort of this and you know and the WWE does this now a lot too it's like we we're on the road for 360 days we you know uh, part of Becky Lynch's story and Mick Foley's story and Seth Rollins story is that they've had that hot dog and they've slept in their car and <laughs> All of that sort of stuff. Oh, hi, doggy. Um, yeah, my dog is apparently upset about that too. Yeah, <laughs> um, but you know, kind of labeling like this sort of like this toughness, where you know, the fact of the matter is, is is you need off time. Like you cannot be doing this kind of physical activity, traveling from town to town, country to country like this all the time and not feel that it's going to hurt you in some way, shape or form in the future. Like the, uh, sure guys like the Miz have found a way to make it work, but guys like Daniel Bryan have not. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's amazing. He was able to come back, but who knows what his, his concussions have caused. Yeah. Um, the years. Uh, I don't It's Yeah. Like you said, what, what is the, like, and, and it is the the proudness to be working for a hot dog and a handshake, um, and you look at a person like Mick Foley and what he's put his body through, and he's somehow still going. I still don't know how that man's alive. Yeah. Uh, but you know, and he and he's still chasing more money. Like he just always, you know, he was a the, he works for you know the uh, an organization called Rain, which which helps uh, rape victims. And the same night when the Ashley Massaro rape story broke, he was on the TV on Raw that night. Mm. You know, it's just, what what is the cost for these guys to just say, you know, I guess it's it just a, it's an addiction in their veins that they have to be part of it and they have to make that money. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I uh, it's kind of, 
it's it's that whole. I mean, I didn't really. I kind of, sort of intended to bring in this in, but not to this extent. I think what's happened here with with Mizero, um, I'm pretty. I don't want to say I'm disappointed, uh, but like the maybe maybe I'll put it this way. It's it's fascinating that guys like John Cena, Daniel Bryan, and all of these people. Kudos to them that they don't want to go to Saudi Arabia. I can admire that and understand that. Mm-hmm. But why is there no outrage about this? Why are why are we sitting silent about what's happened here? And I know that there's some really sensitive stuff, and it's hard to talk about. But like, yeah, absolutely. And, and it's also one of those things too, where it's. Uh, it's unfortunately a who do you believe sort of thing um, because the case was thrown out in court and and maybe her liar her lawyer was lying like there's a lot of parts to it and, and that's not, not what this podcast is about no but it's that same thing of at what point are these these things going to be discussed um, and and when do you you know end the end and those pay per views when do you step in and say you know not tonight the money's not worth it. Maybe we don't need the million dollar payday. There, you know, Vince McMahon's a billionaire. Yeah. Uh, at what point does he just say, you know, maybe, maybe enough is enough. I don't need the Saudi Arabia deal. I don't need to put the show on tonight. Um, we can just run a clip show. There, there has to be some sort of middle ground there. There has to be, or at the very least, an off season where you can just get people to recharge and figure out rest their body and just, you know, at least feel some sort of mental break. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's sort of, it, we're, we're in this sort of, we're, I think there's so many things going on right now that I think feel like, like the, the product, the product's overworked and the product was overworked back in 1999. And it, it's these as we're going full circle and I think it does tie into what happened. Um, we're still overworking everybody. Yeah. And, and, and making it so it's hard to say no. Yeah. And, and, and if Owen Hart had been able to, to say no that evening and say, no, I'm not going through with this, but he needed the money for his family. Um, unfortunately. And that, and that point he could have been let go and, and, you know, he may have found work in, in WCW, um, but it's not what he wanted. Um, and I think he just wanted to finish up his career where he kind of started in the major leagues. And unfortunately that, that, you know, it, it went the way it did and it completely, you know, uh, devastated his family, you know, well beyond anything else. And I, you can say, you know, Bret Hart had, you know, a very horrible oh, decade and a half there. Yeah. Um, and then, and the ripples continue to this day. I mean, uh, Jim Hart, Nightheart just passed away last year, um, and it's kind of been this downfall with the Hart family um, and just tragedy after tragedy. And the Montreal Screwjob was kind of the start of things, but that it wasn't a tragedy. What was the tragedy was was the death of Owen, which yeah. led to you know everything else. You know, the Hart family kind of splintered after that. Yeah. Um, and and then it was the the passing of of Davy Boy, and then it was the passing of Stu and Helen, and it's just kind of unraveled, and it's it's so sad to see, and and it comes back to you know what Stampede Wrestling and the Hart family means to Calgary. We still hold them in that that really high regard, but we've kind of we've almost ran out of of hearts to celebrate, and yeah. it's very sad to see. Yeah, it's 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 true, and it's good. Yeah, it's going to be. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I I don't know what Brett's future is. Um, I mean, he's he's. I mean, at times he's outspoken about the things, depending on the interview, and at times he's he's kept silent. I don't know what his future is is going to be, but um, I I can only hope the best. Now, I would you know, looking back, um, have you do you know what has happened with Owen's family? Um, his son would be 26, I believe. Yeah, I think he's, uh, I, I'm not sure what is, he's done career wise. Very, he's an extremely good looking man. Um, oh. I think he, uh, he went out to Halifax for school. I know that. Um, and I don't know what he took in school. Um, uh, but it must be successful in something. Um, I don't know what his daughter Athena got up to at all. She, she's probably 
probably what 23 or so now mm-hmm. um she was so young um and um and martha is continuing on with the owen hart foundation uh i just started following them recently on facebook and i know they've got a big event announcement coming up soon uh they're gonna bring in they're they're really hyping up whoever they're bringing in they've kind of had uh, major events since his passing to raise money for the owen hart foundation so they've had like howie mandel's come into to put on a show and Bob Newhart and Jerry Seinfeld. Um, so I'm curious to see who their announcement is, is now. Um, but I, I know that I don't think, uh, Martha's ever gotten over it. And, uh, not that she, I don't think she ever would or ever could or, or should. Yeah. Um, and I don't know about his children. I know that they've, they've reconnected at least with, with the rest of the Hart family his kids have. Um, I don't know if Martha has, but I, I know the, the bridges have at least been mended between the, the younger hearts. So mm-hmm. that's, that's one positive that's, that's come out in the past few years. Yeah. That's good. But, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's, 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 it's still tough. It's, it's interesting because there's still probably not a week that goes by that I don't think of Owen Hart. And it's very, very strange. I never met the guy. I was just a, a great big fan of his growing up. And like I said, that was kind of the first big, big death that impacted my life was, you know, the passing of a, a larger than life hero. Yeah. And I think that happened to a lot of young wrestling fans. Yeah, I think it was for me too. Uh it, it, what what so your recommendation if they have people to go back to watch one match, you I'm guessing you're recommending the SummerSlam match between him and Brett? Hands down. That's the best match. Uh uh my my favorite match of all time. I I even have a SummerSlam 94 shirt I bought a few years ago that I wear. Um, it's just, it's a good match. The rest of the Hart family gets involved. Um, you've kind of got all the different Hart characters in there and it, it's good. And it's another one where, where Owen cuts a couple of fantastic promos. Uh, if you can watch the whole SummerSlam 90 show for show, I would, although it has the weird Undertaker versus Undertaker yes, main event. That's a, <laughs> gosh, that's so <laughs> dumb. <laughs> I don't know. Is it the one with Leslie Nielsen too? Trying to find Undertaker? Yes, is that the, yes yeah. it is. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's a. It's. It's. A, I think it's a great show, but it's it's the height of ultimate mid nineties cheese. It's, it's the mid nineties cheese before the Attitude Area. But I mean, it was it was fun. I get it was fun at the time. Um, yeah, but I mean, I remember the MDP, not the. Not the one from this time, but the the base, but the guy with the baseball face. Um, oh, I forgot about that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was it was fascinating. Um, is there anything else we need to talk about in terms of Owen Hart? Or, um, kind of things that we uh, should. Well, what's what? What would be your uh, must watch match? That one, um, I think also. One of my it, this wasn't a match, but one of my favorite moments was the Bret Hart Bob Backlund uh, Ooh, Survivor good Series when he when he was like, "Oh Bret, you're gonna you're gonna break, you're gonna break," and he threw it in the towel, and it was just it was such a cowardly, dastardly thing. It was like, "Whoa, wow, oh, that was so good." That was that was yeah, like that's the that's the the biggest heel you could have. And just doing something simple like that, just being a little, little, little baby brother bastard sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was so well, yeah, because his, I remember he, like, like, it was his, he was getting, his mom was involved, he was like, mommy, you gotta throw in the towel, mommy, you gotta throw in the towel, and it was just And that, he was crying? Yeah. Oh. Oh. It was so good. Or even, even um, when the Hart Foundation initially formed, and it was gonna be Brett versus, or um, Owen versus Bulldog on Raw. Yes. And Brett came out and said, you know, oh, and you're my brother. We should be fighting together. And he just starts crying. Like, oh, my goodness. He was just on another level. The, what, you, yeah. Yeah. What? And, and to go back and watch some of that Stampede Wrestling stuff, too, um, there's there's really good matches out there oh. on YouTube right now. So. Absolutely. Like, there's the Dynamite. He had a great match with the Dynamite Kid. He had a great match with Great Guy and then a great match with Muck and Sing. Yeah. Uh, and there were. I've got to go back and watch that sync one. I haven't seen that one in years. Yeah, underrated. Like the, he was not the Bastion Booger. Misused in WWE. But when he was Muck and Zing, it was like it was a very bad guy. Oh yeah, you, yeah, just so good. And like you said, anything with Dynamite Kid's going to be really good too. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
But yeah, I don't I don't know if we have much else to, to cover off. Just there's there's lots of good books to read out there if you're, anyone's interested in Owen Hart. Um, like you said, de- definitely listen to to that um, that documentary. Yeah, the audio documentary. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of your jumping off point if if there's any sort of interest in. It, you don't really have to be a wrestling fan to be into the story of of Owen Hart and the and the Hart tragedy. I'd say. Yeah, and also like not that I'm here to give John Pollock any plugs, but he did a real. They did a really good job after the November Saudi Arabia show about. Like, oh really? Yeah, he they um, they didn't actually review the pay per view. They actually talked. They interviewed a bunch of people about what happened, what is going on in Saudi Arabia. Hmm. So it was, I'm gonna have to check, take a listen to that. Yeah, um, yeah, I would. Re- yeah, he. Uh, I, it's my personal opinion, and I'm not. Just, uh, I'm getting no money from him, Mr. Pollock, <laughs> but he's probably now the preeminent wrestling journalist. Now it's. I think, in my opinion, he has surpass Mr. Meltzer. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's a, I'll have to definitely take a listen to, to take a listen to that. And the other one too, there's um I don't know if it's a two or three piece, uh there's a good podcast out there and again completely free plugs and I don't want to plug another podcast on the podcast, but uh the lapsed fan has a, a good uh Owen Hart retrospective. Yeah. Um uh, very good listen to on that and they get a, a really good deep dive on it. Um Apparently just because we kind of we scratched the surface, because I think we could talk for hours, hours on, yeah, on the absolutely. impact uh, that he made yeah. on, on on the wrestling industry, and I think on us personally. Like yeah. I, I posted on on Twitter yesterday, was you know he he kind of made me look at how to be you know a, a much kinder, uh, nicer human being because uh, nobody has anything bad to say about him. No, nope. there's not one person that'll say anything bad about him, and that, I think he really shows how how somebody should live their life. Yeah. And it's such a shame it got taken away so early. Yeah. Maybe we'll leave it there. Uh, just do, Jericho's doing a podcast, too, with Meltzer on. on oh, speaker. interesting. Yeah. So, um, but we'll leave it there. Where do we follow you? How can we find you? How can we listen to your radio voice? <laughs> uh, you can follow me on Twitter at poor underscore choices. I'll probably have to change that at some point. Um, I, uh, I'm on LinkedIn is a good place to find me professionally and you can hear me. I don't know if I should, uh, say my networks, uh, I I get so schemish about it. Uh, I'm on, uh, the mornings on country 105 and Q 107 up in the helicopter doing helicopter traffic in Calgary. Um, back in the broadcasting game after being out for quite a few years. Um, and yeah, pretty excited. And other than that, I do social media marketing on the other side. And uh, website building, uh, mostly working with nonprofits. Cool. So all good stuff. All good stuff. Cool. Um, you can follow me, KVOLE, on Twitter. I talk about everything. Uh, Facebook, Kevin Olenek. Uh, to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Find me on LinkedIn as well, etc., uh, etc. Et this was a really good conversation. I'm glad we, we did it. Um, yeah, no, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for the invite. I really uh, appreciate it. No, and I'm glad you came on. Thank you, and we will uh, keep an eye out. we got other stuff going on. Of course, we've got our hockey podcast that you can listen to as well. Um, we will be talking very soon. Bye for now.